Okay, well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first innovation workshop of this year's Genesis Conference. This is a, a really a benefit I think we found having been forced online during COVID was the fact that we could then actually connect with people online. We could do lots more than we could cram into one day in a conference center. And it gives us plenty of food for thought. It allows us to go into topics that maybe we can't corral into one discussion on one day. And I'm delighted this morning that we're kicking off this, this set of innovation workshops this year with Morris Berry, Mike Davies, and Anne Lane, with taking the view of, does the early stage funding landscape of the UK need disrupting? Maybe as a part of me feels it's being disrupted out of necessity or out of policy making, but there's some real first-hand experience of, of how Carousel is gonna navigate this and is navigating this step when you get beyond the, the seed stage and you want to go from series A and beyond, how do we bridge that equity gap? Someone once told me, it didn't matter where you were in growing a company, there's an equity gap either side of you. Um, so it never feels any different. Not that I want to be pessimistic, Mike. Um, <laughs> let's, let's deal with the case in hand. And I'd like to introduce Mike Davies, the CEO of Carousel Bio, who's going to explain and take us through their case study to date. Well, how's your journey been, Mike? Well, thank you very much, Tony. Thanks. Great to meet everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, the wonders of uh, of the internet. Um, can you all see my screen? Um, that's the yes. thing, first of all. Yeah. So uh, what I'll do, I'll tell you about Carousel Bio, what we're doing, where we're going, and how it's all happened so far. Um, we, Carousel Bio, are developing novel therapeutic um, to treat atopic dermatitis, but also to make the skin healthier as I'll come to by potentially delaying aging of the skin. Um, so um, for atopic dermatitis or eczema, um, everybody knows it, most people know it as, it affects up to 20% of children. It does go through and adults get it. And the data says 10% of the US population actually has atopic dermatitis. And I was speaking last week at a meeting and actually somebody there said, yes, I've got it. And this is an adult uh, and it causes problems. Everybody knows it does. It, um, you know, mothers hate putting steroids on babies' faces. Um, I know that personally because my wife, my daughters have atopic dermatitis. It's very common. Um, the treatments are there, but they're toxic. And actually, the treatments, the topical treatments that are there cause, do cause a premature aging of the skin, which is uh, somewhat dis disappointing. Um, the first line treatment, believe it or not, is still an emollient, which has got no therapeutic in it at all. It's a moisturizer. They do work. You know, they do moisturize the skin. There's no doubt about that. The big but is, of course, they don't actually treat the disease. And they, they are the, the first line because the second line, the topical steroids, are toxic. Everybody knows they're toxic. There's steroid phobia. People don't like them. And yet they still bring out new steroids that have the same old side effects and are greasy and just, just not great. And the calcium urine inhibitors, the big, big new non-steroid um, non treatment that came out possibly 10 years ago now, um, is now black boxed in the US. Um, there are lots of new therapeutics, all small molecules coming through. Even the new JAK inhibitors, great. Yeah, they work, they all work. JAK inhibitors burn when you put them on the skin. Uh, it's great. So it's a massive market. And this is where Carousel Bio could make the big difference. As I've said, there's lots of things that are out there. Lots of things all targeting the inflammation, new things coming through that target the itch because that's very important. But the main thing is they are toxic. Um, what we've got is something completely different in that we are a peptide or carousel bio is a peptide. It won't have the issues that the compounds that are there have and the compounds coming through the small molecules coming through which i've listed some here will have 
you can predict it. The market, I've said, is a huge market. If you can also prevent the disease coming back, which you could term as a cure, you can make that an even bigger market. And if you can delay the aging of the skin, it becomes even bigger. And this is where our peptide could have a major role. We've shown that it not only prevents inflammation, stops inflammation, it also, we also show that we can prevent the activation of inflammation. And therefore, the science says we could delay the aging of the skin. It will be safe. It's a topical peptide. It will be broken down. Of course, it will be into naturally occurring amino acids. And it will only work at the site that we apply it because we will apply it topically. So we won't get systemic side effects. Um, Carousel Bio started, um, we actually started in, two th we registered the company in 2017, but nothing happened. Um, we actually started in 2018. Um, usual friends, family, myself put money into Carousel Bio. Then we got an Innovate UK grant. Innovate UK were fantastic. Um, <laughs> um, we got the grant approved just as the pandemic was announced. And um, uh, we actually couldn't do a massive amount, even though they, the way I view it now is they kept us going through the pandemic, which was fantastic. That allowed us to get seed funding. And so we've raised about a million and a half UK pounds over this time. And we've shown during this time that we can switch off inflammation, prevent the activation of inflammation. We've shown we can deliver it into the dermis of uh, uh, this peptide into the dermis of the cell. And we've shown not only in cellular studies, but also now in biopsies from people with the disease, that it works. We've got grant, we've got patents approved, we've granted in the US, Japan, um, and Europe. Uh, we've got more patents that have that have been written and submitted, and we plan a very important adaptive clinical development when we get there. The issue, of course, is getting from this seed to getting to regulatory approval for clinical trials. Uh, as I've said, it works in human biopsies. So we've taken biopsies from people with the disease, put them in something called a Franz cell, measured the inflammation markers underneath, then put our compound on top and shown that we can significantly reduce that inflammation. It works at an exceedingly low dose, 100 nanograms per mil. Um, what we want to do with the investment is develop this into a fantastic cream. That cream will moisturize the skin. It will feel brilliant when you put it on so that people want to put it on. It will be absorbed rapidly into the skin and won't leave the greasiness that some of well, all of the ointments do. And we've shown we can deliver it in, into the dermis of the, of the, of the skin. It will reduce the inflammation. If you keep using it, it will prevent the disease coming back. And if you keep using it, it should delay aging of the skin. This is what we're looking at in the future, uh, now and in the future. We're looking for a total of six million UK pounds. This You could call it Series A, could call it peri seed, you could call it anything, but we're looking for a total of six million over the next six million pounds over the next two years to get us to regulatory approval for clinical trial. Then, of course, we'll need a, a more money, 20 to 30 million to get us through to clinical proof of concept. Um, not only atopic dermatitis, we've got the potential in other um, therapeutic therapeutic areas, but atopic dermatitis, because it's topical, there's less that we need to do from a toxicology point of view, um, but we still need to do toxicology. Um, big Pharma are interested, but of course, they all say, wait till you get to the clinic. Um, and that's where we need investment to help us get there. When we get there, um, well, when we, get, when we get to regulatory approval, exits are either we IPO at that stage to raise the investment to do the clinical trials, or 
we get to clinical proof of concept and um, exit at that stage after our adaptive um, clinical proof of concept, which is the end of year four. At that stage, we should be at a valuation currently um, um, at around $1.2 billion. We've got a fantastic team. Uh, John Nicholson is our chairman who's been in the pharma industry and been in the tech industry um, for a long time. He was retired. We got him out of retirement to help with Carousel Bio. Um, David Browning is helping as our strategic advisor to again help with raising investment. Uh, he's had uh, lots in there and is very much in, involved in the uh, biotech area uh, and with uh, OBN. Uh, we're searching for a new financial director. Our previous one, unfortunately, had to retire through illness. Um, We've got supporters, um, key supporters and advisors that will that are helping and help us with formulation, with the with the, all of the preclinical stuff that we've been doing, um, and this is where we are. So we know that topical steroids work, but they are toxic. There are lots of chemicals, small molecules out there that work, but they are toxic. There are many people trying to find that new safe topical medicine to treat atopic dermatitis. Um, it's a big market. Our compound, this peptide formulation, works in biopsies from people with atopic dermatitis. We know it's going to work when we get to the clinic. It not only switches off the inflammation, it will also prevent the activation of inflammation that we've shown, which would mean if you keep using it, it'll just stop the disease coming back. And the science supports, if you keep using it, we may actually delay the aging of the skin. The other approaches are small molecules. Our peptide approach is novel. Um, topically, we've shown that it works. And if we can show it works, we'll show that we delay the aging of the skin. Um, currently, our current investor, Deepbridge Capital, are very keen to help us Money is tight in the UK. We need other investors to come into this round of six million to get us through to regulatory approval for clinical trial. And ideally, an investor at this stage will come in and participate in future um, investment to get us through to clinical proof of concept. And if we can show we can delay the aging of the skin in that clinical proof of concept, um, it opens the market enormously. Um, thank you very much. Many thanks, Mike. I think that just highlights for me the real casing point of, you know, you have good solid data, it's potential on the way to meet a big unmet need, potentially very large markets. And yet, we still have this, this arduous journey to raise capital in this gap. And I mean, reflecting on your experiences with investors out on the road i mean of late i mean do you get a sense that the uk we shouldn't knock the uk unnecessarily i think this is you know early stage funding is difficult in lots of places um what's your sense of the uk ecosystem compared to elsewhere if you like i mean i know you've spoken to investors geographically diverse so do you get a sense it's better or worse elsewhere um I think, I think it's the same everywhere. I think it's better in some places, and they've got um, uh, whatever whatever it is. It's better in some places, particularly I would say the U.S. But I know the U.S. have have issues, have problems with raising. Everybody has problems with raising money at the moment because of everything that's going on. Um, you know, it was, there was a big rush in the pandemic and we've shown it showed in the pandemic. If you throw money at something, um, you can get a compound, you can get a new medicine through incredibly rapidly. Um, you know, but trillions were thrown at, 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 to treat um, 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 the coronavirus. Um, and, you know, fantastic. They did a brilliant job. Now there are things that are causing people to hang on to their investment, to, to their money. 
you know it's you could you could view it you could view it that it's just as good to put it in the bank because they get a good interest rate and they've got the safety in the bank well <laughs> you say that of course <laughs> <laughs> um, whereas pharmaceutical development has risks of course it have, has risks uh, we de-risked it as much as we possibly can, but there will, there will always be. There was you can predict formulation is the issue that I see, and that's why we need to spend a lot of money on formulation. But if we can get something that just a cream that releases a nanoparticle formulation uh, with the peptide in it that sh that feels fantastic and is moist, if we can get that cream, it will be a step change in the treatment uh, for people with atopic dermatitis. Um, mild to moderate, which is 80% of the people with atopic dermatitis. Mm -hmm. um, different in other places. Yeah, it, every, it sh it's different. It's difficult everywhere. It's difficult because we're, we're in inflammation. We're not in oncology. If we were in oncology, um, I think it's less difficult. Um, cancers affect lots of people, one in two of us. And there's a big drive. Um, I could go on about why, <laughs> but um, cancer is can, cancer kills lots of people still. Treatments for cancer are not great still. Um, treatments for cancer don't cure cancer. They prolong life by a month or two and make you sick as a dog. Uh, family experience, I... I know it um you know i've seen it i've seen it and thought i'm not going to do that <laughs> anyway that but that's oncology oncology yes money is still in oncology other things less so i think that'd be a, a good point i think from from my perspective just to have Anne and, and then maybe morris introduce themselves and and give their perspective before we delve a bit deeper in but maybe as part of the introduction and and setting what's shaping your opinion and, and where you sit. But just a sort of a brief sentence really about, you know, do you see that the UK landscape needs disrupting or is it being disrupted? Ladies first. Morris, I could comment on that, but I won't. Um, <laughs> I, um, so I'm Anne Lane, I'm CEO of UCL Business Limited, which is University College London's wholly owned commercial subsidiary. And we focus on commercialising the intellectual property that results from the university's research base. Um, I think actually universities are doing a lot of that disrupting. I think, as Mike said, there was a lot of money thrown at things like vaccines for COVID, but that didn't happen overnight. The money was at late stage, but that research had been going on for 20, 30 years to enable it to happen that quickly. And if you don't have that really strong blue skies research followed by translational funding then you're not going to have the drugs at the end of the process i think something that was really disruptive was the focus on translational funding so the wellcome trust mrc put a lot of translational funding in and certainly for ucl that was a step change and i you know ucl is a leader in cell and gene therapy those are very expensive research projects to undertake and then they're very expensive in terms of getting them into the clinic but the next disruptive step that was taken, which was again with the welcome, was founding Syncona, um, because actually they were the reason behind a lot of our now NASDAQ listed companies getting to market because they were putting in Series A funding of 30 million at a time and then following that money. So I think, you know, there, there's more disruption that would be good in terms of the Mansion House Compact, opening up pension funds to be able to take riskier investments uh, and then having those deeper pockets so that you're getting proof of concept funding which is something that a lot of universities are now putting in place to just make that jump from basic research to applied research then putting more money in in terms of seed funding university funds have series a funding so our current ucl technology fund can actually go up to series a but you need to build those companies. You need venture builders. And I think that's the next disruptive step that we need to take, certainly in the UK. Some of it's already there. And I think, as Mike said, we should be celebrating success in the UK. We've got a lot of things to be proud of. 
I'm not so sure is that the UK isn't good at this. I think that the funding structures are really, we're a smaller scale. If you look at the US, all of our companies that are now listed, they listed on NASDAQ because pockets were deeper there. And for those sorts of therapies where you need, where they're capitally intensive, you need that bigger quantum of funding. I don't think that necessarily means that those companies then move to the US, they need to have a US office there. But in, in the case of Autolus, for instance, which is one of the first companies that listed, they've got big offices up at um, uh, out west in Acton and they, they've created you know, a number of jobs for the UK. So I think actually there's a lot of disruption going on. I think the, the pension fund reforms that the government has talked about I think the spin out review that, that's just been finished by the government was actually very helpful in supporting the fact that actually universities are pretty good at doing this, but they could do with more help and that it is patchy across the country because UCL is a huge university and not all universities are and not all universities are used to doing this sort of work and translating research into commercial companies. So I think there's there's a lot that has been done. There's things that have been done recently but I think there's more there's more to be done and I think clarification over where POC funding will come from which the Chancellor identified and they put 20 million in that's a great start that's over the whole of the UK so it probably isn't going to go that far and then I think you know the pension fund reforms and clarification of what that's actually going to mean and how that's going to work is going to be really quite disruptive for us certainly if it opens up extra funding into university affiliated funds that can then syndicate with established investors like Syncona and like F prime, for instance, then actually I think that will make a huge difference, not just for big universities, but for, but for the excellent UK research that's going on in universities across the country. Thanks Anne. And I think that segues quite nicely into many conversations you and I have had Morris about where you go to for funding at different stages and the role of the different actors. I mean, Anne touched upon what universities can do and maybe we, it needs someone else to pick the baton up. But in your experience, you've been through probably advising every size of company um, and different stages. How do you see that landscape in the UK? Um, so uh, I concur with what, uh, both the other uh, panelists said, um, I, I genuinely think that the UK isn't doing badly at all. I think it does very well. I, I think we're not very good at actually promoting that, perhaps, as well as we should do. Um, I think just picking up on something Anne just said then um, and putting it into a word, I mean, I think she said, sorry, correct me, Anne, if I got this wrong, but you, you mentioned everybody's talking about the pension funds, and you said very clearly um, you know, how that will work and, and what it will be. And I think that's the first point. That's still very much sort of over there. We don't know what's happening. And we're talking about it will allow syndication. I totally agree with that. But the word that really kind of needs to be clear about and what that means is de-risk. So the syndication will allow funds further up to de-risk by spreading the risk, right? That's the first thing. So to me, when we talk about, um, well, we're in Britain, so let's talk about Britain first. Um, Britain, I think, has raised uh, more venture capital consistently over the last five years than Germany, France, Holland, Belgium, and somewhere else combined. So we are good at this. It's as simple as that. We are good at this. We have very good universities. We have excellent tech transfer offices. That's not to say that there aren't as good tech transfer offices in Switzerland or France, ETH, wherever, it doesn't matter. Of course there are. Um, you know, that's basically basic statistics to me. If you take 100 people, 100 people, two people are going to be dumb as whatever, and two people are going to be ridiculously smart, and the rest are kind of the medium, right? That's basic fail statistics to me. But I think what's important is that we're going back to what is disruptive. So I've said this for years, and you know this, Tone, and Van knows this as well, I think, from, from our discussions. I think to me, what is the difference in the US? There's two things, and I've said this over and over again, and I'm still kind of saying it 25 years on. Number one is the NIH. Number two is the capital. We talk about the depth or maturity of it. It's not that it's better. It's 
it's um, delineated. If you want X amount, Series A, let's call it, you go to these guys. If you want more, you go to these guys. What's interesting is those guys, as in Series A, will say, no, you need more than that. You need to go and speak to John. So they will actually, they are very clear about what their fund size does. That's the first thing. They're very clear about what they invest in and what their fund size enables and, and allows. I personally don't think we have that in the UK. We still don't have it. We have, and this is not meant disrespectfully anymore, we have a, a, a almost a bottom-feeding mentality. And what I mean by that is it's not everybody is looking for the very best they can get. That makes sense. But everybody is in swimming around to get the best investment. And what they want is it, they want to get it as cheap as they can, as little as money for as much of the equity as they can. Now, that's business, but I think it's it's it creates a different a difficult scenario. And you could then go, OK, so let's take the US out. Let's talk about Britain and Europe. Right. The problem we have here is basically overvaluation. Right. And as we go further down the line, that creates a massive problem of where we are if there are you know, trials and tribulations, which we all know happen in biotech. So just thinking about what what would be disruptive to me, two, uh, so not two, so firstly, I think that I'm personally going to stick my neck on the block here, and I'm not happy that we put the money into the Horizon program. I'm absolutely not happy with that at all. With all the expertise we've got here, I would far rather have seen that money kept here and appropriated for companies in Britain. I see no point in being part of the Horizon program other than academic research. And there are big projects and whatever that are important. But again, this is what we talk about. We talk about, you know, you see it on LinkedIn or whatever. I hardly go on it. It's like Facebook for business. But basically, you see, you know, way we put 27 million into a space thing or we put 22 million into this. It's inconsequential amounts of money. We're talking about the NIH has $48 billion a year which it appropriates into health. Just take a step back and think about how big that figure is. That goes into health. What does that enable? That enable, enables proof of concept, most certainly. Companies often pop up in Europe, and now I'm using us as within that geographically. In Europe, they pop up and they have a patent and they have some reasonably good data. In the US, they often pop up with clinical phase one data or clinical trials of a diagnostic or whatever, hard data on public money funding from NIH grants. We don't seem to have grasped that yet. Now, everybody leaps around and, and was, you know, the Horizon program, whatever. And I think I'll, I'll, I won't mention names, but, um, you know, it's the largest fund in the world, whatever. No, it's not. The NIH, I've just said, is 48 billion. So that 80 billion euro fund horizon, 90 billion or whatever it is now, it's over five years. So the problem is that the money isn't as much. It's appropriated all over the place. In my opinion, it's malappropriated. And what do I mean by that? Again, it's not the capability of the individuals of the intellectual quotient that we don't have in this country. Far from that. We have, I think we used to be the, the highest producing um, intellectual property country per GDP in, in the world at one point, right, until recently. So it, all those things, I don't think we harness what we have very well. And I think, you know, reports on how good spin-outs are, and I've forgotten the name of the report, and um, the spin-out report or whatever, I think it's tech transfer thing. You know, it was very good, but it's another report. And I always scratch my head and think, how many reports come out in the US? And they don't. Because actually they do, they act. And I think the difference is, so there's clear delineation in the States, right? That's what we're really talking about. So basically, NIH, Series A, angel funding, well, there are groups of investors. I think Mike mentioned angel investors. Whatever. So angel investors club together, they syndicate. So they can make bigger angel investments than we get over here. Series A funding, we always hear the same figure, five, six, maybe seven or eight. In the States, minimum 10, usually 15, up to 25. Series B is 25 to 50. And then there on it goes up and up. But these are clearly delineated. And they're looking at, I think they also, what we don't have here, and we, I still don't really understand why not, 
but we don't have billion dollar funds. So there's nothing pulling up. There's no, nothing market led with pushing up all the time. There's nothing pulling it. I mean, billion dollar funds like NEA, like kind of, uh, well, I can't think of all their names now, Orb Med and, and, um, and Dan, who I interviewed a couple of years before you turn up, what his name, and Dan Olmstead, used to be HMQ, Tecla. There's lots of those. And what do they do? They're in the traditional venture capital model game. They are there to pump in huge amounts of money to take you one place only, to the public markets. They are there to pump that money to do the IPO and have marketing and sales and distribution figures. That's what they're there for. So the issue is that we don't have the level of funding, in my opinion, beneath that stratified that people can go to and work together. And when I say work together, we fund to this point and then we get Series B and whatever. It's just, well, it's, but, that, that's but, my issue. If I just come in, I think that's a, a really point I'd like to go back to Mike and Anne around, I think, this stratification. Because, you know, there is horses for courses, I get that. But, Mike, first of all, I'd like to come to you in terms of your impression of that stratification when you're pitching to investors to raise six million. How much of your thought process is in, are these investors going to take me through the next round? I think that it's a desire. It's a it's a desire, and that's what we talk about. But it it's I agree with Morris. It's not connected. When I when I have spoken in the U.S., they've come back to me and said, "It's you know, it's it, it's not enough. We can do this. We have a it's a completely different talk to the U.S. The numbers are different." to the US, they pretty much equate to the UK pound, but they, they're different. And they said to me, they we, we've tried in the UK to this, doesn't matter what series you call it, this next raise. And it's, as Morris says, there's nothing, nothing pulling, it's a, it's a push. You've always got to, um, you've always got to, find the right people and pull the right people together and it, it's talk it's not it, it's difficult and that's why that's why lots don't succeed and lots don't do it but it's difficult i go to the u.s and talk at one meeting in the u.s and investors it was an investment meeting and they come up to me and say yes the only thing that we need to do it's become a U.S. entity. They can only invest in a U.S. entity. So, you know, we're not a U U.S. entity. Yes, we've got we've got a U.S. registration, but we're not a U.S. entity. Mm -hmm. So to pull that money, we have to become a U.S. entity. Which, fine. If the U.K. can't support, can't do, then the U.S. can. And I I agree with Anne. There are We've got fantastic universities in this country. There is fantastic <laughs> abilities to pull things out of universities and form companies. But then those companies are left. There's nothing there to pull them or to push them, support them um, up to up to regulatory approval for clinical trials and into the clinic and clinical proof of concept. It's, it's clinical proof of concept that's the important thing. Proof of concept, it works in a cell. Great, fantastic. But big numbers aren't invest aren't interested in that. Can I can I just put a caveat in there? I think one thing I want to say is it, it is difficult, Mike, as you said, and it is difficult in the States. It's not a sort of utopian ideal in the States that because there's more money, you're going to have success there necessarily. Yeah. It is equally difficult, and frankly, it can be more brutal. Um, one of the things which I, I don't know if anybody on here remembers, but I spoke to three people back in COVID, I think it wasn't it, Tony, and uh, one of those is Don DePadizzi, yeah. who's basically a serial CEO, uh, and he's over in Denmark now. And, and I asked him quite simply, what's the difference between uh, a European CEO, an American CEO, and he said, "We think as we think of billions." Hmm, yeah, 
they're, so they, they're, they're, they're investments of another note on the end, at least. Yes. And that's not that's not to say that they are materialistically money oriented people, but that is what they think of. They think of billions, not millions, mm -hmm. billions. And unfortunately, for an investor, so when you say this is a billion dollar market, pretty much their their eyes will always glaze over because they all hear that because we know that. So, you know, it, it's it's sort of okay. So the the real questions they want to hear is what's your timeline or the answers to the questions are, what's your timeline? What's your near to market potential? Um, what's your capability on delivering on that? What's the reality based spend that you're looking to achieve that? What also are your fallibilities? Where are the holes in your team, yourself? You know, what do what can you not do? What do you need us for? That's smart money, dumb money. And then um, also marketing, uh, sorry, sales, marketing, distribution, markets. Now, you know, early stage series, I get it, not going to do it, but you should have some concept about it. And they're so much you more... Hold that for a second. Just, just hold that because I'm really keen to hear from Anne. Sorry. Because of the success of Autolus, Orchard, and, and other UCL spin-outs by going to the US and securing capital and growth, what do you learn from those companies? What, as Morris has just framed, that's what the investors need to hear. So I'm, I'm kind of, was there a clear route for, for someone like Autolus to be able to attract that capital? Well, I think... I think really the, the, the difference we're seeing now is that our investors are tending much more towards a venture building model. So whereas they put the money in, they'd let you get on with it. Actually, you need an investor who's going to help you with a lot of the things that Morris has just outlined. I mean, I, think I would take issue with Morris over Horizon because I think certainly from our point of view, we were so pleased when we got that money. And if you, if you, I can see Morris laughing, but if you, if you left <laughs> that funding in the hands of the government, I'm not sure any government, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not uh, being partisan. I think it would disappear very quickly. I, do, I, do, I didn't want it. I didn't want it run by the government. I think we've got keep people capable to run that 2.5 billion. And run it efficiently, not government. Well, but, no, I, I I agree, but as long as that's regulated properly, because we've seen what some people yeah. do with money when it's not, you know. Uh, not well, no. But but anyway, and I think also to talk about marketing and sales when you're looking at life science companies, which are generally pretty early on, and uh, usually end up, I they do they will list, but very often they're not thinking about marketing and sales because they're thinking about acquisition and and actually why would they do marketing and sales and distribution when actually that's a that's a totally different set of skills i think more important is looking at manufacturing which is an issue with a lot of drug delivery that mike's talked about you know nanoparticle technology can and, and formulation and stability is a huge area and if you know you can have the best drug in the world but if it's not stable and you can't get it where you want it you, you know you're stuck really and the same in cell and gene therapy you know we've got a current drug that's actually on the market but but the problem is with manufacturing so i think there are areas of, of investment that we really need to to look at i think in terms of looking at the us it is a it is yes they are talking billions because it's a bigger country but actually you've still got to justify the returns you're going to get whether you're you know when you're when you're developing if you are a even a series a, a life science company is not going to be looking at necessarily billions whether it's pounds or dollars of investment what you want is support and you want investors who are actually going to be intelligent in terms of what the business needs and again looking at angel investors very often other investors will shy away if you've got a cold group of angel investors invested in a company because they see it as disruptive and if and depending on the board representation so i think that scenario you've got to be really careful because if you have too many interests on the board which can be disparate you're then that's also going to be a problem because that will also stop the company i think developing and growing okay. i think we do have i think we do have investors in the uk that will actually put you know I, i've got the list here of of four of our companies where the series a funding ranged from 13.2 million up to 30 million and that was syncona and f prime but they then followed their money as well and i think that's key that you put in those Mm. Big Series A fundings where required. You don't always need that much money. Depends on the technology, but then you follow that money too, so that you know you've got investors who know about your business, want that business to succeed, 
And, and also, I think, again, I would take issue with the fact that you've got to be in the US. There is, you know, there is an issue with that. But we with Apollo Therapeutics, which, you know, was a big collaboration between universities and big pharma. We, have, you know, the main investor in that is a big is a big um, US investor. And the company is in the UK still very much a UK presence. So I'm not sure that's always that's always necessary. I, I, do think, I, do think, I do think in that point, yes, if you're a collaboration of universities and you've got that uh, kudos, you can get big investors, international investors to pull money into the UK. Of course you can. But if you're a small biotech that is a British biotech, you can't do that. It doesn't work. It's not the same as having all the university, you know, not all, but, you know, the big you know, universities. Well, uh, actually, Mike, that's a really interesting point, because one of the things we're always told, and, and we see it with investors as well, is that actually they don't want necessarily to say they're a university spin out because they see that as a negative, unless you're Oxford and Cambridge, which have that brand. Yeah. So, so I would also say, you know, it'd be, be good for investors to think about the brands of the universities that are behind those spin outs, because I think UK universities are world leading and they're seen as such. But actually, I don't think I think they're missing a trick, actually, by not using that to, you know, to actually as a basis for attracting investment. It's interesting that bit though about the university spin outs and we hear the spin out review and we, we hear the incentivizing of, of tech transfer and trying to scale that up. Which you know, coming from that background, I, I would support that we should be supporting tech transfer. I don't have an issue with that. But how does the UK look if you're not starting from a university? So if you don't have the university behind you, so you don't have the university funds, the seed funds, proof of concept funds. You know what happens in the UK landscape then? Mike, you're probably going to tell me you go to the states, but I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, that 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 is it, I'm afraid, because there is nothing, not nothing. We got great support from Deep Bridge Capital mm -hmm. um, and they want to keep going, but there isn't the the investments not there. I mean, Innovate UK, actually, I think, has, has helped. They um, helped. They helped us early. They yeah. did. But they're not there. They're not there to help us where we are mm -hmm. now. Yeah. So they won't give us. A million pounds to formulate and regulatory approval approval you know get, get in, engage with the regulators that's not what innovate uk does uh, they're great early on they were great they were great for us innovate uk were fantastic without them we wouldn't be alive now mm. um, i've got no issues it's that it's 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 the gap, the the I support. Think, it's support. It's not just the money. It's the support. It's everything associated with it. That in the so, US, I've found, I've found, um, it's it's there. So can I just said I I just I was I kind of sort of breaking up um, bits of what both of you said and I've added to it, mate. I'm just thinking about this the other way around, right? What what does an investor want to see? So, you know. The, the ticket size has to be right. It has to be right. It's not just a bunch of money for people to sit there and, you know, I mean, the, the classic line, we're not buying you a Porsche, is I have actually heard it. And they, that's very true. You know, salaries are salaries, et cetera, but costs and what are you going to do with this? What's your buffer? All these things fit in. Now, I agree with that. You don't have to go to the US. You don't have to move out necessarily. I'm actually raising the process. I'm raising 30 something, 3 million and, 17 or 18 million at the moment, that money is coming out of the Middle East, Middle East, Middle East, Middle East. Um, there are British and American funds there. Uh, there are trillion dollar funds, believe it or not, in the States that are American. They're not Chinese, Russian. Uh, super, super, super big ones. And I, I'm just thinking about this because I just suddenly recalled this. And I remember being on some panel about 12, 14 years ago. So, um, I think back then, the raise in the states in private equity venture capital for everything, all sectors, was something like two point something trillion dollars. I can't really remember now. In biotech, I think the total raise was something like 30 odd billion. And I think early stage was five or six hundred million, even in the states. So think of those numbers trillions, billions, hundreds of millions. 
So what is it that they do differently? I think that they just appropriate it differently. Well, I'm going to say as well is that what, when people come to me and say, can you help us? I, one, have to believe in them, the people. We haven't really mentioned that. The people, I have to truly believe the people. What Anne just said about you know, a, a band of angel investors, yeah, very dodgy. Equally, don't have 10 founders or four founders or six founders or whatever. Don't have you know, a board that's just full of people who've all got kind of equity splits and shareholders' rights and whatever because it's a mess. And investors will walk from that. The more complicated thing is, it doesn't matter how. What you've got to remember, and you've always got to think, is that no matter how good your potential product is, it always comes down to one thing, fit, right? So if they've got an opportunity to invest 50 million and it's going to give them maybe a hundredfold back, that's their big unicorn, whatever moment, right? But actually, if they don't like you, and they don't like your team, and they don't see how it's going to work, they're not going to invest. They'd rather go and get 10 times their money with somebody they really like, that they can see a clear path or whatever. And so um, maybe forget the numbers, but that's really important thing. So I kind of sit as a hired gun fixer, if you like, between big sums of money in that aren't listed, that aren't easy to find. I mean, huge amounts of money, but massive family offices, or not even family offices, but fund to fund scenarios. And they are they trust me fundamentally to be their buffer to do their due diligence so i go through the company i go through whatever it may be i think about what's needed and sometimes they ask me to stay on in that company in some capacity and drive it forward but here's the other thing i know what i'm good at uh, and that's not being arrogant or big-headed i know what i'm good at and i know what i'm bad at good skill i know what i'm bad at uh one is obviously being politically correct as Anne will back me up and um but the other is that actually I'm not corporate in any way. What I'm good at is collating something, getting on the right tracks and running it, having it positioned in the right way so that then you can run in a corporate as a corporate business. So that's getting and mentioned manufacturing rightly so. All those things are incredibly important for an early stage company to have. And very often the expertise isn't there. And sometimes that's okay as long as you've got the balls or the gumption to ask for that help. And I think it's back to what I said about smart money, dumb money. The more you ask, the more likely to get. If you don't ask, you don't get. So, so that's, think about that's a really good point. I'm conscious of time, but I would yeah. like to touch upon, just come up two or three times in passing, really, in terms of the need, and you mentioned about the need to think about, well, where's the manufacturing going to be? And, you know, we see things like the cell and gene therapy manufacturing center created to try and upskill the sort of talents available able. and Mike is key to where you're looking at this is what we need to get done that's the tipping point so do we think the UK is strong enough with a deep enough pool of people to take the companies we're starting into that process are there is there enough of those people around I mean, I'm, I'm going to come to, to you, Anne, because I mean, you, you put these coming out of the blocks and, and you look for these. But equally, Mike and, and, and Morris, what's your idea? Do we have the right talent pool to scale companies in the UK? So I think we, we, we do. There's lots of um, very talented young graduates coming through. And I think the degrees that are being offered actually cater for that so biochemical engineering chemical engineering all of all of those skills i think um the funding that goes into the entrepreneurial training of those individuals is actually key because i think the theoretical side of the science is fine but it's the practical applied side and where it's going to be used and having an idea about the spin out and what you might expect because you want those talented people really to go into and take the risk of going into early stage companies and and building those companies as well rather than say going into big pharma and i think that's the key part of it is it's actually quite frightening to suddenly be presented with an option certificate if you get employed by a spinner what does it mean can i pay the mortgage all of those things and i think having entrepreneurial training for for um, undergraduates for postgraduates and, and phd students i think is is key and i think that's certainly one of the things that this government's picked up on and i know the shadow government is looking at as well and i think the other thing is 
backfilling, and we've said this for a long time, and you and I have had discussions about this, if you want a key academic from a university to go into a spin-out or spend time with a spin-out, somebody's got to pick up their teaching duties and their research and their lab and their publications. Who's going to do that? How's that going to be funded? So, and also being able to go backwards and forwards between industry and academia. I think that's key as well, because if you know it's not the end, you know, that's the end of your academic career, if you go into industry, that's a much bigger, scarier decision to take. I think having that fluidity between the two disciplines, I think, is 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 mm. really key for this because that's where you'll get the really talented people who've got some commercial experience and knowledge going into these companies knowing they can have a foot in both worlds if you like and, and i'm sort of put you on the spot a little bit here mike and i'll apologize for that because i just thought of the question but it's um it's that bit about when i meet those young talented graduates phd students postdocs and looking really keen to go into the spin-out space, either form their own company through the accelerators or to join that that dynamic. We're doing really exciting research. I think um, one of the well-known commentators in our sector described it as the Bart Simpson end, where you just don't want to grow up, but it's really exciting. Um, <laughs> but, like, you know, I don't meet as many of those individuals who are focused on the development, the manufacturing side. So is the manufacturing aspect and joining a spin-out company as attractive to those individuals, or are they looking to go to more established companies? Do you think as an entrepreneur, you can attract those people as well as they would go to a, an AZ? Well, okay, so I'll answer that. I'll say, first up, I'll say, so first of all, and this is critical, so if I'm raising the money and my involvement in the company, I won't be able to hit the ground running. I'm not interested in training on the job, change management, not interested in that i need people who can do that job now that may seem wrong but the investors are giving you that money to reach an end point whatever that may be inflection point end point whatever that's what it is so i want somebody with bona fide experience yeah i get that morris and i really do get that but i just wanted to come to mike because uh, this is yeah, sorry. An entrepreneur. you know it's it's kind of i see it it seems to be easier to attract that young talent pool into an entrepreneur company at a research stage than it is attracting that talent at a later stage so if the talent isn't there i'm just i'll come back to that one but it was just a, how does that feel from a, a company founder perspective i'm just i'm just concerned a bit about morris putting his gloves and hat on you're getting a bit cold there <laughs> it's <a bit> freezing <laughs> yeah I, I can i can imagine i can imagine <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, um, I, I, I love the idea of bringing somebody in, um, young person, uh, bringing them in and when they leave, cause they're not going to stay forever. They leave having learned lots, but I very much understand Morris's point of view. Um, you know, we're not a university. Universities teach. We teach in a different way. Um, we educate in a different way. And ideally, we have someone who can come in running, on the phone running. And the, to me, the best way of getting that is to work in a pharmaceutical company, big pharma. You learn, I learned loads uh, in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, I see that as a massive benefit because, and yes, we do look at manufacturing and GMP manufacturing and GMP stability. It's very important. Um, uh, it's very important. So we know um, that the people we go to now to manufacture our peptide peptide can upscale through to clinic market, up, upscale all the way through to market. We know that. That's why we go with them. Um, because they can do that. Um, people, people, young people are important because they are our future, no matter how you look at it. Um, and it's important that they get educated, the value of universities and schools. They learn differently in a company. We need people to run. Mm -hmm. We don't need to spend all of our time teaching i see that as a university mm. 
I think, okay, I think, I just, I think I'm, just, I'm conscious of time, Morris, so I want to come to you next. Sorry, go so I'm conscious we're into the last few minutes, so I'm going to sort of wrap it around the panel with one closing question for you, because I think that absolutely addresses your point, Morris, um, in terms of we need to find people ready trained for these companies. You can't take the risk as an investor on teaching them. But if I can go back around the panel, so Morris, please do answer that point. We've got four minutes, but then if each of the panelists can tell me, the time of year when we're writing our letters to Santa saying, dear Santa, I would like. Now we've told them many things that we'd, we'd like to see develop and, and we will a lot. I guess my question for you is, who are you addressing the dear Santa letter to? If we're gonna disrupt or evolve the UK early stage of funding landscape, you're gonna say, what I would like is someone to sort this out for me and give us a really good system to build companies. But who are you saying dear to? So, Morris, just on your final point quickly, and then we'll go around and we'll wrap up. Um, God, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, all right. Well, I suppose then I would want to see, uh, I'd address it to dear UK government, incoming or outgoing, whichever it doesn't matter. Um, I think I'd want to see an all party understanding of the mid, uh, mid, what I call mid requirement in startup that's funding and growth and development so one of the things i think that either Anne or both or, or mike mentioned you know it really isn't once you get series a money depending okay if you're therapeutic but certainly for diagnostic med tech anything to, look it's not research it's development it's development 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 that's the word that investors want to hear and see their money is going towards something they if they are savvy in science then they are aware that there's a risk they are aware there's a risk but you have to make sure that that risk is placated in their minds development don't say research that's it <laughs> and who's your who you're writing to so mine would be to the uk government as well but but also i think to grant funding bodies so government run ones and and private charities to look at their translational funding because a lot of the schemes that were there are no longer there and I think they if they could reinstate those that would be good and then in undergraduate degree courses so that's universities is is bringing back and there are still some sandwich courses I did a sandwich course that's where I learned a lot about industry and yeah. business. made a huge difference I think those those things are key have they gone? I didn't know that. Have they, they gone? They are. There are still. There are still some, but I think they're not. It's it's usually optional, and I think they made such a difference. I think it's. I think it. I think they made a huge difference when I went to Imperial. The snobs basically said, you know, we don't do sandwich degrees, and then they introduced them. So they've dropped. I didn't realise that they were dropping. Oh well, that's I, I went to a polytechnic. I wasn't as elitist. Well, as no, I went, went to a polytechnic, it. darling, and then I went to Imperial. That's what I mean. That's where Imperial said, you know, no, we don't do sandwich. I went to a university and I didn't know about sandwich courses. Um, but anyway, uh, who, would I, who would I write this letter to? Um, I don't think there's anybody I can write this letter to. So it would have to be a Dear Santa letter. And it would be Dear Santa, please can we do something to the UK? Um, I do like Morris's all party side of things rather than specific parties uh, to the UK that facilitates the development of novel medicines to more safely treat patients, people in this country. And that is university spin out supporting them even more companies starting nothing to do with universities that support mechanism and the support is not only money it is people um information connecting people it's a it's a big picture thing that supports the development um and that's a santa thing because i don't think there's anybody here that does that at the moment well, you never know. Centre's full of magic, so we shall see. Um, from my perspective, I'd like to, to thank all of you for sharing your views. When I say to people I'm the chief executive of One Nucleus, 
one of the things that I'm really pleased that I have that role is the fact that I get to be part of conversations like this. I wish we could have had this meeting over a coffee or over a beer and it would have been equally as entertaining for us present as it would be informative for us and anybody else listening. Um, but for now, I'd just like to thank you and I wish everybody a, a good Genesis conference. And for those I won't see at the conference, a very happy Christmas. And I hope Santa is kind to them, especially you, Mike, because you've now made a point of saying it's his responsibility. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Tony. Than